Welcome to Mosaic. If you are here for the first time or you're watching online, I'm Christopher Goss, and we are glad you're here. Um, this week, we are kicking off a new series called Bless. And in shaping this series, we've used a book uh, by John and David Ferguson called Bless. And we have some copies available. If you'd like to read along with us as we walk through this series, we'd love to have you with us on that. Just please let me know after the service. Um, before we jump into the message, I just want to pray for a minute. Lord, um, just thank you again for your presence. God, I ask you to speak to our hearts so that, Lord, when we leave this uh, sanctuary, we would have clearly heard from you. God, would you speak to our hearts? Lord, we love you and we bless you. In your name we pray, amen. Worship team, thank y'all. Thank y'all for such good leadership. For those who are checking out Christianity, maybe for the first time, I want you to know that you can enter this series with tons of freedom. Tons of freedom to just listen and absorb what Christianity actually is and how we live it out. But if you are a member of Mosaic, I want you to remember that our mission is is in a broken world, we help people become whole through Jesus. So my hope is that this series will give you tangible, clear tools to personally live into that mission. Because like me, I hope some of you have felt wrestling inside for years. I've, I've dealt with frustration for years because I, I know... In my soul, in the depths of my being, that every single person needs a deep relationship with Jesus. I believe that. But when, in full confession, I often feel directionless when it comes to helping people hear about Jesus in kind and meaningful ways when they aren't connected to the church. And so I'm grateful when God brings people into our church but I've dealt with real frustration wondering, what am I supposed to do with people who never darken our walls? Am I just supposed to silently wish they knew Jesus while their lives basically go untouched with the good news about him? In their book, Bless, John and Dave Ferguson write this, The church that we started grew large. We saw lots of people discover the love of God and follow Jesus during that time. But what I seldom saw were people in my neighborhood, people I saw every day coming to know the love of God and following Jesus. I seldom had spiritual conversations with people who lived where I lived or played where me and my family played. You can imagine when I read that, I thought, that's it. That's it. They have just said what I've been wrestling with for years. How do I reach people that I care about in my day-to-day -day world, people that don't go to church, with the good news of Jesus, the good news that he who is the most kind, most gracious, most loving, generous being in the universe is actually king. That's the gospel. Jesus is king, eternally so. You see, I think there are two equal and opposite mistakes that we can make when it comes to reaching people with the good news about Jesus. There's what I call drive-by evangelism. Come on, y'all. You're, you're in the grocery store. You're trying to get some milk, and somebody comes up to you. If you were to die tonight, do you know where you'd go? And you're thinking, I'm hoping I'm just going home tonight with some milk and some cereal. Dave Ferguson talks about how with their own experience of drive-by evangelism, they didn't understand. It just didn't make sense that talking about such good news should always end up feeling so bad. The other mistake is what I call osmosis evangelism. And I would like to say I'm a huge fan of osmosis evangelism. <laughs> I have this dream that I will just be such a nice guy that people will see me and they'll be like, he's a Christian and he's a really nice guy. Therefore, I should become a Christian because I want to be nice like him. <laughs> it's just going to happen by osmosis. Guess what? In 31 years of following Jesus, 
I have never once personally seen anybody come to Christ without real meaningful conversation. Osmosis doesn't actually work. Friends, what I've longed for is a third way. A way that connects with God's promise to Abraham that we studied in Genesis. That he would be a blessing and that all nations on earth would be blessed through him. What I've longed for in evangelism is an evangelism that blesses people even if they don't become Christians. That reveals the love of God. I think we found that third way. It's called bless. Bless is a third way because it helps me live out what I believe as a Christ follower about every person's deep need for Jesus. It connects me to what God is doing in their lives, in the lives of those in my normal circles of engagement. It helps me love those in my circles of engagement, and then hear me on this, trust God with the outcomes. Do you hear that? It rejects both passivity and manipulation. It helps us to live into God's vision, to be a missional community that helps people become whole through Jesus. I think in many ways, Carolyn has been teaching and modeling this way for me for about a decade, and the blessed book just gave me tangible wording for it. So I hope this series doesn't come to you so much as new as much as it comes to you as clear. I think this is something we've been building on for a long time. So what is evangelism? Contrary to popular belief, evangelism is not selling religion to people. Anybody remember the show Green Acres? Yeah. Yeah. All right, teenagers, don't worry. We'll, we'll get to you at some point. But y'all, y'all remember Mr. Haney? He'd show up to Mr. Douglas's house. Mr. Douglas, have I got a deal for you? And then he'd try to sell him some terrible thing. The good news is evangelism is not that. It's not selling stuff for Jesus. Firstly, evangelism recognizes that God is the ultimate evangelist. He is the only one who can save souls. So he has been looking for us long before we were looking for him. We call that provenient grace. Secondly, evangelism recognizes that God is a community. Think about that. He is a community of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons who are in loving relationship with one another. So evangelism is God who is a community, saving people into a community. Do you see that? God's a community, and he's saving people into a community. Evangelism is God the Father, through Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, inviting people into deep fellowship with him and his church. That's what evangelism is. That means real evangelism recognizes that God is an evangelistic community. So bless, begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve, story, because these actions make space for God to save people into his community. So let's pick up and look at how the early church dealt with this. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2, and we'll pick it up in verse 42. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand and someone will be glad to bring you one. And if you're using one of our Mosaic Bibles, it's on page 1092. There you go, right there. All right, we need a Bible right here. There you go. Hey, I love that. I love it when people want the Bible. Praise God. So we're in Acts chapter 2 and we're going to pick it up in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. I want you to underline signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And I want you to underline this last sentence. And the Lord 
added to their number daily those who are being saved. Now, a little background on this passage. Jesus has been crucified on a cross. He's been raised from the dead. And now he has ascended to the throne of God as the king eternal. That's the good news. 120 of Jesus' followers are still in Jerusalem, and they are gathering regularly and praying together. Suddenly, one morning in one of their prayer gatherings, the Holy Spirit began to rush like the wind, and it was, the Holy Spirit was poured out. He was poured out on those who were praying, and they started proclaiming the glories of God in many different languages. This happened on Pentecost, which was a Jewish festival. Because of the Babylonian and Assyrian exiles, roughly 600 and 700 years before Jesus, many of the Jews who had come to Jerusalem that day were from other parts of the world. That's why um, Luke, the writer of Acts, says that God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven were present. So the Jews who are present grew up, listen to this, the Jews who are present many of them, grew up in places where Hebrew and Greek might not have been their native tongue. Now these followers of Jesus who are from Israel are being supernaturally empowered to declare the wonders of God in, native tongue, in the native tongues of these foreign-born Jews. So they've come from a long way in these native Israelites or people from Israel are able to speak the glories of God in ways that these travelers hear it in their native tongue. Does that make sense? If you remember in one of our earlier sermons this year in Genesis, we read about the Tower of Babel. Does anyone remember what God did to those who were trying to build this city and this tower? Anybody remember? Change their language right? They all had one language, and then God comes down, and the text says he confused their languages. Basically, he gave them a bunch of different languages. Why? Because he wanted them to not be able to make life work together apart from him. What's going on in Acts 2? Acts 2 is actually not the reversal of the Tower of Babel. Because God didn't give the language, or excuse me, give the world one language. What he did was he gave Jesus' followers the different languages they needed to restore the world. Do you see the difference? God didn't restore the world to one language. He rather gave Jesus' followers the different languages they needed to restore the world. And consequently, there were some 3,000 people who were added to their number that day. I would like to say that that is permissible church growth. Come on, somebody. (laughs) And then in verses 42 to 47, we get a picture of what normal community life was like for these disciples of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the term disciple just means you take on the discipline. You begin to live the way the rabbi lives. You live according to his teachings. And at the end, we're given this powerful line. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. A few things to notice. Firstly, the Lord is adding, not people. The Lord's the one that's adding people to the community. Evangelism is God helping others discover God, full stop. Let me say that again. Evangelism is God helping others discover God, often through a partnership with you and me. Do you see that? God is the evangelist. Secondly, he's adding to their number. They weren't being saved into isolation, right? There are no Lone Ranger Christians. They are being added to a community. Thirdly, they are being saved, John Stott notes that Luke, the author, is emphasizing that salvation is a progressive experience culminating in full glorification. This means that community is really essential because you want to help people grow into the fullness of their salvation. If they aren't being saved into a community, they can easily be picked off. 
Lastly, the Lord keeps adding to them how often? Daily. John Stott points out that this means evangelism for the early church wasn't an occasional or sporadic activity. It was a lifestyle. They lived on mission. And you'll notice that they lived on mission by devoting themselves to certain practices. I want you to think about that. They lived on mission not as some kind of like, I don't really know what we're doing, but we love Jesus. No, they devoted themselves to certain practices. And what were those practices? Firstly, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What were the apostles' teaching? They were expanding on the teachings of Jesus. Teachings like love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. Teachings like let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What I want you to notice is Jesus and the apostles are teaching the early church to be a blessing. Do you notice that? They're teaching them a proactive holiness that blesses the world around them and so reveals God. They devoted themselves to fellowship and to the breaking of bread, meaning that they ate together pretty often. And I want to say yes and amen to missional eating. I'm here. I'm here to serve y'all. And you might be saying, Christopher, but doesn't the text lend itself to make us think that they're only sharing meals with other Christians? I think it's easy to force that lens onto the text because of our own experience. But I strongly suspect that these first believers were doing it like Jesus did it. He fellowshiped and had meals with committed disciples and notorious sinners. And by his fellowship and dinners with notorious sinners, outsiders became insiders. They became followers of Jesus. And then they devoted themselves to prayer. The gospel tells us that Jesus often went out to lonely places to pray. His ministry, hear me on this, wasn't going around doing good things for God and then asking God to bless it. Jesus wasn't going around doing random acts of kindness. His ministry started with prayer. He prayed. He saw what the Father was doing. And then the Father invited him to join him in the work he was already doing. Why? Because the Father is the ultimate evangelist, not us. Evangelism finds power by us joining God in what he is already doing. That's why when when you read about signs and wonders performed by the apostles, why? Because they were prayerful. They were seeking what God was doing, and then they joined him in the work. Friends, real Christian ministry flows out of real prayer. And they took care of one another. The scripture says all believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to everyone who had need. Now, come on, y'all. Doesn't that aggravate you just a little bit? I don't like it. All my sensitivities get up. It feels way too close to socialism for my taste. What is more, how do they know if they gave to a needy person if this guy wasn't going to waste it on alcohol? How did they know they weren't going to help in a way that helping actually hurt? Do you see it? My 21st century individualism, my American capitalist feathers get ruffled because I think this is about a bureaucracy. This isn't about a bureaucracy at all. This is about real people in real relationship with other people who actually knew what their needs were because they spent time with them. And so they knew the needs of other believers. And like Jesus, they took time to know the needs of people outside of the camp so that they could minister to them and invite them in. Friends, uh, Mark was reminding me this morning, John Wesley said, the whole world is my parish. The whole world is my parish. That kind of blessing orientation became a lifestyle. And the Lord kept adding to their numbers daily those who were being saved. If God is saving people 
in community, we need to think like farmers rather than spiritual insurance salesmen. Let me say that again. If God is saving people through community, we need to think like farmers, not spiritual insurance salesmen. You see, farmers don't grow fruits and vegetables. You heard it here first. They don't grow fruits and vegetables. What do they do? They prepare the soil. They plant the seeds. They do things that offer good conditions for seeds to grow. So what are the practices that bless people and make space for God's grace to work? You guessed it. Begin with prayer. Listen. Eat. Serve. And story. When you entered today, you were given a card. A card that I forgot to bring up here at 9 o'clock. But I finally have it at this service, so that's good. And on the, on the back of the card, it says group members. Obviously, that's for your life group members. Write down their names so you can pray for them consistently. Keep this in your Bible. And that way, every time you're in the Word, you can pray for people consistently. But then you'll notice the second one is neighbors. And as to neighbors, we're going to ask God to show us this week people who are outside of the church that he wants us to consistently pray for. And you may be asking, well, who qualifies as a neighbor? That's a great question. People in your circles of engagement. So for some of you, it may be people actually that live in your neighborhood. Or it could be people that you see regularly at work or at a third space that you frequent. Someone across the country may need your prayers, but they aren't in your consistent circles of engagement. So I want you to think about this locally. I want you to think about this in your context. Secondly, I want you to keep it to one or two circles of engagement. Don't think widespread. Think one or two circles of engagement and just six or seven people. Why? Because if you get beyond a couple of circles and if you get beyond six or seven people, your prayers will become pretty unfocused and you probably won't see God. You probably won't be attentive enough to partner with God in what he's doing. So you want to kind of keep it pretty focused. Um, secondly, or let, me, let me say this. So our hope this week is to spend time asking God who are on kind of who's on his heart that's in my circles of engagement. We write down their names and we consistently pray for them. And then we interact with them. Why? Because when we interact with people, we actually get to listen to them. Have you ever noticed that when somebody really listens to you like they're not coming up with the next thing to say. They're not coming up with some quickie solution to your problem. They're just locked in. And when somebody listens to you like that, it feels like being loved. Have you ever noticed that? So guys, our opportunity is to genuinely listen to people and to listen to the Holy Spirit and then care for souls. Just care for people out of that listening. And then we're going to eat. Why? Because it's my favorite of the steps. <laughs> because amazing things happen when you eat a meal together. Defenses drop. Conversation opens up. And genuine fellowship grows. John Ferguson writes that there is something about sharing a meal together that moves any relationship past acquaintanceship towards friendship faster than just about anything else can do. And if you're a cook like me, <laughs> I'm, I resemble that remark. If you're a cook like me, meaning you're not a cook at all, I want you to notice that these don't have to be home-cooked meals. God can powerfully work through good Japanese restaurant food. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Folks, when you begin with prayer, and then you make time to listen to, pe to, to listen to people, and then God opens up a door for table fellowship, 
there's a good chance that you will know how to serve that person in a way that actually blesses them. Why? Because they're not a stranger and you're not a bureaucracy. You have a personal relationship and you can actually serve them in a personal way. Come on, somebody. That's the good stuff. And all of this creates opportunities for humans to do what humans do. We like to tell stories, right? We like to tell stories about our lives. And if we've been walking with God for any measure of time, we ought to be able to talk about things God has done in our lives. So friends, God is an evangelistic community. So bless Begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve, and story, because these actions make space for God to save people in community. And I want to say this, students, during worship, the Lord impressed this on me. Paul talks to Timothy, and he says, don't let anyone look down at you because of your age. I want to say that's a word for you guys. Don't let anybody look down at you because of your age. The same Holy Spirit that's in me and in Carolyn and in Taylor is in you. And God doesn't come in fun size. He's God. So trust that God wants to use you in this very way. And I, I want to thank Taylor who spent specific time investing into making sure that this series really invest in the ministry work of our students. Not in the ministry work to our students, but in the ministry work that they have in their context. And so I want to say blessings over you guys in that. Amen. <laughs> Friends, I want you to know that this is about the long game. This is about the long game. This is not drive-by evangelism. And in true mosaic fashion, it's about loving people and holding on to them long past good sense. God hasn't called us to make converts who quickly convert to Christianity and then just as quickly fall away. God has called us to make disciples who through faith and patience see God's salvation worked out into every area of their lives. And that's why community is essential. Do you remember what we said about Pentecost? God didn't restore the world to one language. God gave Jesus' followers the different languages they needed to restore the world. Friends, the people of our world speak all kinds of different languages, and I'm not talking about English, Spanish, and French. I'm talking about the languages of our experiences, right? The languages of drug addiction, the language of codependence, the language of a solid traditional family background, the language of single parenting home life, the language of generations, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, Gen X, boomers, the language of trauma, and the language that came through uh, traumatic abuse. Friends, the good news is Jesus is king. The most loving, kind, benevolent being in the universe is king even eternally so, but here is what is desperately needed. What is desperately needed is for the people of God to do what Jesus did. Yes. He entered into people's world. He was incarnational. He took on human skin. He left heaven, came to earth so that you and I could begin to experience him and then begin to see who the Father really is. Friends, that is what is needed. So the future of evangelism is not one size fits all language. It is intentionally entering into people's worlds, listening to them, learning to speak language so that they can hear that the good news that Jesus is king is actually good news. Something far kinder than drive-by evangelism. Yeah. And something far more intentional than evangelism by osmosis. Like Jesus, it's going to begin with prayer. It's going to take listening to others. It's going to take table fellowship, serving as the Lord directs us, an intentional conversation about what God has done in our lives. Like Jesus, are we willing to bless specific people so that they might hear the good news that Jesus is king and he desperately wants a relationship with them? Like the early church, are we willing to devote ourselves to certain practices 
Practices that create space for God to work in the lives of those around us. As we get ready to take communion, I want you to ask the Lord a question. Cindy, you can come on up. Lord, who in my world are you calling me to intentionally bless so that they may receive your invitation to this table? This table is for people who are in love with Jesus. Friends, we got to want. That seat right next to you that's empty, it represents a soul. It represents somebody that doesn't know the love of God. And so this really isn't about attendance numbers. It's about kindly serving people so that they begin to experience the love of God. And this table, God wants them at this table. So, Zach, you can bring the lights down. I want us to spend some time in prayer over this question. Lord, who in my world are you calling me to intentionally bless so that they receive your invitation to this table? I want you to pull out your card. There's a pen in the seat right in front of you. And I want you to take a minute. I just want you to listen for God. And these people will go under neighbors. Who in my world, Lord, are you calling me to intentionally bless so that they receive your invitation to this table? Lord, would you speak to us right now? Would you help us to know who you have called us to partner with you in making space to experience God, in making space to come to know you? Lord, we're just going to listen. Speak to us, Lord. Lord, we love you and we bless you. And we are so grateful that you have been seeking us long before we have been seeking you. God, we ask you to give us the grace to be incarnational, to enter into the worlds of other people, to get to know them, to listen to them, to care for their souls. And Lord, we ask you in prayer to begin to illuminate our thinking. Lord, that in prayer we would get ideas from you that are just supernatural ideas. They're just good ideas that come from your mind, not simply ours. And then give us the grace, teach us how to walk those things out in compassionate, caring ways. Lord, your word says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers. God, there are several workers in this house already. Lord, I pray for increase. Increase in our missional wisdom. Increase in our love for our neighbors. And Lord, for those for whom this is like, hmm, this is a brand new thing, Chris. Lord, I pray you would cast out fear. You would give them peace and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that we would learn this together as a community, that this would not be some homework assignment people have to go out and do, but this would be something that we learn as a community over the next several weeks and, frankly, over the next several years. We love you, Lord, and we bless you, and we thank you. 
In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Friends, we're about to take communion. And I want to make space for us just to get our hearts right before God. Because communion is, is for the table of the Lord. It, it's, it's for all those who are in love with Jesus and at peace with their neighbors. So I want you to just take another minute and really reflect and say, is there anything I need to confess before the Lord? Is there anything I need to get right with him about before I take communion? Take a minute in prayer. Lord, would you forgive us and would you cleanse us by your blood? Yeah. Lord, we have failed to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness and your grace. Thank you, Lord.